a high school student shot outside school along a busy street. RTD plans to triple the number of its police officers by the end of the year. Republicans at the state capitol make their stand against home warranty companies giving people the choice of an electric stove instead of just a gas stove. This is about moving towards the Valhalla of electrical energy. A suggestion that there's legislation coming that would limit how much Excel can profit off Coloradans. And she'll be making a quick run from Steamboat to Denver. Well, not, not quick exactly. She is going to run it. Why is just one of the questions we have on next. The person shot outside, of, <clears throat> pardon me, shot outside of East High School this afternoon is a student. And police say that person is seriously injured and might not make it. Police got the call around 2.30 from 17th and Esplanade, so right in front of the school along Colfax. Police say the suspect shot from one car into another, and that's when the 16-year-old was hit. A couple hours later, police caught and arrested the two suspects at Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in Elmira. Mark Salinger has been out talking with students at East. And Mark, obviously a very scary day for them. Yeah, Kyle, the shooting happened right as students were being led out of school just this afternoon. There's a car at the intersection behind me right now that's riddled with bullet holes right outside of East High School. Tonight we know that that person driving that car was indeed a student at East High School, just 16 years old. Denver police say a driver drove by and fired several shots at the car coming out of the street in front of the high school. East was placed on lockdown for more than an hour before students were eventually released. We talked to a couple of people who were waiting for their friends when they saw it all happen. The first thing I thought when I heard the shots was, are my friends okay? I just wanted to go over there and see. And then now I'm just more worried about like that kid's family and a bunch of the people that were hurt by this because there was a lot of kids around that and kids shouldn't have to deal with that. Everyone here is of course hoping for the best for that student who was hit by that gunfire. Denver police however tonight saying that his prognosis is not good. Kyle. All right Mark Salinger thank you. RTD's new police chief has been directed to increase security and cut down on crime on public transit. His solution is to triple the size of his department by the end of the year. Chief Joel Fitzgerald says criminal incidents on RTD are down since 2020, but he acknowledges that the public does not necessarily feel safe on RTD's trains and buses. He says one of the most frequent concerns that they hear about public drug use, assaults, and uncomfortableness around people riding transit. In response, the chief says he plans to dramatically increase the number of sworn officers from 22 to 70 and then to 140 by the end of 2025. The chief is also pushing for a change to RTD's code of conduct, banning people from riding buses and trains all day without a place to go or lying on a floor or a bench in an RTD station. Some would argue, well, what are folks doing that are staying on trains? Well, let me give you an example. If you drive, if you're in an airplane, do you have to deboard the aircraft when you come to your arrival spot or do you get the ride, you know, back and forth as many times as you like? The objective here is to eliminate the bad behavior, not to over criminalize anyone, not to be insensitive. An RTD committee will hear Chief Fitzgerald's plans to hire more officers on Wednesday. They'll also hear about the proposed changes to the code of conduct, which advocates have said clearly target the homeless. Republicans at the state capitol have their smallest minority in history, but they are focused on moving the debate on the issues that matter, like the largely make-believe war against gas stoves. Democrat-sponsored bill moving through the state house would require home warranty contracts to allow homeowners to have the choice of an electric option when replacing certain gas appliances. It would be up to the homeowner to decide what they want, but they couldn't just be forced to take a gas appliance. Environmental groups and Excel Energy support the bill. Republican Scott Bottoms from Colorado Springs managed to turn his ode to gas stoves into a not particularly subtle mockery of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. When it comes to stoves, I am a huge fan of equity. I believe that all stoves should have the right to end at the finish line at the exact same moment. Gas stoves should be able to allow to have all the opportunities that electric stoves have. Gas stoves should be propelled for, if we see a gas stove dropping back through some type of legislation, we need to encourage that gas stove to move forward. If you ever wonder if you're missing anything at the state capitol, trust me, you're not. 
The claim that Democrats want to ban gas stoves keeps getting circulated by Colorado's Lauren Boeber and others, even after the Biden administration and federal regulators came out against the suggestion. A single regulator floated this idea based on some studies showing gas stoves emit pollutants. If you're looking to get your Valentine something expensive this year, might I suggest an XL Energy bill? I don't imagine that our Marshall Zellinger is going to get any roses from Excel. Not after two weeks of reporting that's making us all smarter about how Excel reaps record profits as our bills skyrocket. Tonight, a top Democrat in the state Senate hinted to Marshall about legislation that might be coming that would limit how much profit a utility could make off its customers. When Excel was approved to increase gas rates $64 million this past November, the average residential customer bill was supposed to go up $2.09 a month. A small business customer, $12.95 a month. That's not including the price of gas that caused our bills to skyrocket. It does include that $2 million we told you about to pay back Excel for the outside legal team it hired to get the rate increase approved. Phil in Littleton emailed us, why do we pay for Excel lawyers? The short answer is that costs rate payers pay Excel must be just and reasonable. In a statement, Excel defended the legal fees reimbursement, saying in part, the fees we incur in connection with those large cases, whether for outside counsel or technical expert consultants, are part of our costs of service. These are costs regulators have approved in rates in all our jurisdictions, and doing so is a standard practice across the country for all utilities. Personally, I don't think it's appropriate for rate payers to pay the utilities lawyers to increase their rates. Democratic Senate President Steve Fenberg tells us a lot of what we've reported on in the last three weeks, like paying Excel back for its legal fees, could result in new legislation. We need to have legislative action on making sure that the investments that occur are in the public interest. The Office of Utility Consumer Advocate, essentially our public defender in utility cases, has taken the issue of reimbursing two million in legal fees to the legal system. UCA wants a Denver district judge to review the lawfulness of the Public Utility Commission's decision to approve that two million bucks. But here's the thing. Even UCA, our defender, thinks legal fees are okay to get paid back for just not this one. In a court filing, UCA wrote, UCA is not challenging Excel's right to recover rate case expenses, including attorney's fees, when those expenses are properly supported by evidence that demonstrates their reasonableness. Long story short, UCA does not think Excel provided enough receipts to justify two million bucks. Two million dollars spread out over one and a half million gas customers is a fraction of the base rate increase that took effect in November. It got me wondering what all goes into a base rate that makes up the biggest part of your bill when gas prices are not spiking. Mm -hmm. That's a story number 15 in a row for tomorrow, breaking down what the PUC looks at and answering viewer questions. Does the PUC ever say no to a base rate increase? You know, you don't always see public anger translate into legislative response quickly. Sometimes you do. I mean, I think back to like the summer of 2020 and the protests after George Floyd's killing. This is a pretty rapid response to public discontent about XL making record profits while people see record bills. Right. However, Senate President Steve Fenberg did say, and I, I probably should have used it in the story, he says, I don't know that we can do something today that will affect your bill tomorrow. Sure. But it's responding now so that when we're talking about the next rate case increase, uh, maybe the, things will have changed and the PUC says, well, the legislature says we can't do this anymore. So no to that. Yeah, they're not knocking down anybody's March bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, Marshall, thank you. So you always hear talk about lessons learned after a disaster. A Purdue University professor hopes what he learned following the Marshall fire could make an impact across the country. Here's Katie Eastman. So six different water systems were impacted in Boulder County, and these served 300 people all the way to 21,000 people. You guys get ready to cut loose. In the moments of the Marshall Fire, firefighters would get to hydrants and realize they had no water pressure. Embers burned the generator for Superior's water treatment plant, and workers at Louisville's water plant made the decision to let untreated water straight from the lake flow to keep water in pipes for firefighters. I will tell you that if Louisville didn't keep water in their pipes, you would have seen much more destruction. Many, many, potentially thousands of homes lost. Purdue professor in Andrew Louisville. Welton came to Colorado and looked at the water Those systems are. during and after the fire. Drinking water pipes. Welton says that decision in Louisville was the right one, but it's not part of any city's disaster plan. He says it should be. One of the recommendations for a new study encourages utilities and state agencies to talk about 
What are the conditions that would prompt that to happen? His new case study, published by the American Water Works Association, has 20 recommendations to improve water system disaster response and recovery. And there's really been no national push to help everybody. That's what this case study does, is it puts everything down on paper, identifies the nuances between all these different incidents, and then puts a path forward that people can then take. Welton says Colorado started taking that path forward right away, using science from his team to guide them. The local communities, the state officials, all lean forward. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. While Professor Welton was here, his team tested private wells impacted by the Marshall Fire. They found that shallower wells were more likely to be contaminated with chemicals associated with soot and ash. Your word of thanks microgiving campaigns focus on small to mid-sized nonprofits in Colorado. Honestly, they know how to do more with less. And it means that what you raise each week really makes a significant difference for nonprofits that make a significant difference for Coloradans. So thank you for raising more than $17,000 last week for the Denver Asset Building Coalition. Their tax prep services for the lowest income Coloradans bring millions of dollars back into our community each year. Your ideas lead to many of these weekly campaigns. So if you have a suggestion of a nonprofit or maybe just an issue that you would like to see addressed by one of these campaigns, email me directly at next at 9news.com. Denver Rescue Mission is back in the city's good graces after nearly losing a multi-million dollar contract because it was openly discriminating. And an ultra marathoner prepares for a little run clear across Colorado. I have had a lot of people that said, oh, it's all downhill. <laughs> no, it is not. We'll meet her next. Denver City Council has approved a multi-million dollar contract with the Denver Re Rescue Mission just a couple months after that nonprofit was caught discriminating against LGBTQ employees. The nonprofit's discrimination was a direct violation of the Rescue Mission's contract with the city. But the Rescue Mission is still going to get this extension at $9 million this year, $300,000 more than last year's contract. It looked for a bit like the funding could be pulled or at least not extended when it came out last year that the Rescue Mission's employee handbook banned gay and trans employees. Denver Rescue Mission paused and then abandoned that discriminatory rule. Denver's Department of Housing Stability says they're currently in compliance with the city's rules. We got a whole baker's dozen of the Denver mayoral candidates who have their first televised debate this week. It's on our air. It would be weird if it was not on our air and I was talking about it, right? It is the great debate at Metropolitan State University. This Thursday, February 16th, candidates for Denver mayor will debate for two hours on KTVD and streaming on 9 News Plus, 7 to 9 p.m. The debate's being held in conjunction with Metro State University, Clado, and the City of Denver's Fair Election Fund. The 13 candidates who are participating in that matching taxpayer funding have been invited to participate, and actually part of the deal is they have to participate if they're taking the taxpayer match of funds through the FEF. This is the first of three debates. We'll air on 9 News. Hey there, what a Monday. Nice mild temperatures as we soar back into the mid 50s. A delightful one and a little bit above our average too. Across the eastern plains, 50s, even some spots in the 60s for us. Up into the high country, a little chilly. Teens, what we're talking about in Kremlin, the 30s and 40s. Further to the west, we have one storm system that has been impacting parts of western Colorado. Looking at that snowfall, still filling in around Telluride through Durango, all the way up into parts of Jackson County. We zoom out, there's that one storm system. It'll pull out late tonight in to tomorrow and then we gear up for this next one. You probably heard folks talking and buzzing around town about this next storm that's on the way late tomorrow night into Wednesday. It looks like a good one, especially up in the mountains into far southeastern Colorado. For us here in Denver, we'll get a couple of inches. As we look ahead toward tonight, things clearing out. Tomorrow morning, might wake up actually to some rain off to the eastern plains. Still a little bit of light snowfall up into the high country. We have the clouds starting to push in by tomorrow afternoon, and then it's going to be later tomorrow evening that we see the first signs of that snow here for the Denver area. How much? Well, again, all the advisories, the watches, the warnings, they're in southern Colorado. Anywhere between about four to eight inches, and then further out to the west, that's where we have the warnings near the San Juans, where they could see potentially a up in the mountains, one to two feet of snow. Here in Denver, it looks like about three to six inches coming our way. Some higher totals once you get up into the foothills. We'll also have to deal with some pretty gusty winds up in the mountains and then off to the eastern plains. So blowing drifting snow could be an issue. Tomorrow, kind of that transition day as we're sitting in the 40s here for the metro. 20s, 30s, up into the high country. And then hello, storm system. It's coming in. It's bringing the snow. It's bringing the cold. 
temps down to the teens on Wednesday at four, a mighty four overnight into uh, Thursday morning. Yeah. And then we bounce back the weekend, always eyes nice. on the weekend. Back to the 50s we go. Way to deliver. You got it. Hey. Hi. There you are. Good to see you. Okay, speaking on behalf of a state, it's nice to have you back. Thank you. I tried to bring the sunshine, you know, a <laughs> little bit. I, I love all the people who've been writing in for the last however many months. Where is Danielle? What happened to that girl? Yeah. Uh -huh. There were hints. I mean, like I was saying, I mean, we had nine months, and it was uh, a glorious nine months, and then I had my sweet baby girl. Took some time off, got to play mom, yeah. and now I got two titles. Mom that's, and meteorologist. That's the best. Yeah. You, and, you and your husband dreamed of this for so long. Is it everything that you imagined and more? Yes. And more. And more. And more. I mean, the sleep. You know, people said, sleep now. Oh, boy, did they mean it. Uh -huh. Because I haven't had much of that. How are the bags under my eyes? Looking good. Uh -huh. um, but it's just so much sweeter. So fun, too. And I know as she gets even bigger, it's going to be more of a delight than it yeah. already is. Exactly. Exactly. And nothing lasts forever. The good stuff doesn't last forever, and the bad stuff doesn't last forever. Nothing lasts forever. Okay. So. I like that advice. There you go. And soak in every moment. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Good to see you. You too. She's training for a long distance run. Like, really long. I like kind of like 50K, 100K, 50 miles, but I will be training for something much, much bigger than that now. <laughs> An ultra marathon for the purpose. Next. An ultra marathon runner is going the distance. It's kind of what she does. She's doing it to start conversations like this one about multiple sclerosis. Our Byron Reed has her story. For most runners, every step means going a great distance. But for long distance runner Kendra Miller, I like kind of like 50K, 100K or 50 miles. Every step means so much more. I found out that two, two family members um, one which is very close, uh, got diagnosed with MS. Kendra was selected to run a stretch through Colorado for the MS Run the U.S. Relay. The ultra run is more than 3,000 miles long. It starts in April and continues through the summer with the goal to raise awareness and funds to support multiple sclerosis research. It's the longest relay in the world across the entire United States. Um, starting in Santa Cruz and ending in New York, New York. My segment's going to be 179 miles from Steamboat to Denver. Kendra has been fundraising and training since October with a mission of her own. Like every time I run and it's something that maybe is a little bit out of my, my comfort, I just think more about like, especially my brother-in-law, he's, he's one that got diagnosed and his whole life has changed and he's completely out of his comfort zone every day. Kendra's brother-in-law is only 44 years old. She says she plans to dedicate every mile she runs to him. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy to see how much someone's life can change so quickly. Um, you know, he's young and he used to work long, long hours, long shifts. Now he can barely stand, you know, for like a couple hours. Kendra hopes each step she takes will help people like her brother-in-law. And it's just so sad because he's so young. And get them closer to a cure. It's just spreading more awareness and helping others that need it. For next. I feel like I should be doing this. I'm Byron Reed. Kendra says it'll take her six days to finish her portion of the race. She's going to run about 30 miles per day. Your feedback is all Danielle Grant all the time. Next. Stack feedback about Danielle Grant, but only a few seconds. Bob says with her back, Winter already feels warmer. Elsie said, welcome back. Glad you were away for such a great event in your life. See you next time.